Hi, everyone. This is Rob Gray from ASU and the Perception Action Podcast, back with another article review. In this one, I want to look at the topic of blur. What effect does blurring your vision have on sports performance and the development of perceptual motor skills? And this is inspired by this recent review paper uh, published in Frontiers by Limbali and colleagues, looking at kind of reviewing the research that has been done on blur. And to foreshadow, <clears throat> there's some really interesting findings here. Not only does blurring your vision not really seem to hurt your sports performance, which has a lot of implications for some of the training that's being done out there, but also it seems to actually help in some cases. Blurring the image seems to actually help with skill acquisition. So what I wanna do is kind of go through some of the paper, add, add my kind of two cents here and show you some of the research that has been done. So what is blur, right? Blur obviously is what we're talking about here is lower resolution, uh, lowering, lowering the resolution of an image, lower acuity, right? Obviously, I think most people know we deal with blur all the time, right? Um, in our vision, right? The world around us is filled with high detail, high resolution everywhere, but we only see in high resolution with high acuity right in the center of where we're looking where we have cones and our fovea, right? That's only place where it, it, at any one point where we get high acuity vision. Everywhere else in our peripheral vision, right, is blurred, right? Because that's where the rods are processing light and rods have, because of the way they're connected in the, in the eye, they have less resolution, right? So we don't really notice this, of course. We don't notice this the world is blurred, but we deal with this all the time. So we can utilize both high detail, high acuity information from our central vision and lower resolution information for our periphery. In particular, our periphery, the low resolution is good at detecting motion. We don't need high detail to detect the movement of an object. And there's various ways that we cope with this, right? We could move our eyes around a lot, right? So if we move our eyes around a lot, we're gonna see in high detail uh, everything. Another way that's been talked about in sports is what one I discussed back in episode 154, is the idea of using an anchoring strategy or what's called a pivot point strategy where you kind of park your eye somewhere so that you can use effectively both central and peripheral vision uh, for controlling actions, right? So that, that's a kind of the main point, right? Blur, blur in an image is not a unique thing, right? If we add it in an experiment, we deal with this all the time. So how do we create blur in a, in a study? So what we want to talk about is uh, some research that has been done on what effects does blur have on various aspects of sports performance. How do we create blur? Um, there's a couple different ways. There's dioptric blur, which is essentially, we can think of this type of blur is blur due to your, vi your eyes, <laughs> your visual apparatus, right? When I take my glasses off, I create this type of blur, right? Because my eyes, my lenses, uh, my eye muscles are not accommodating properly for me to see clearly, right? Because I don't, I can't, right? That's why I need glasses. So the world is still all around me is still in high resolution. It's just, I, I've created a situation where I can't focus on it properly, even in my central vision, right? And the way that we do this typically in experiment is by putting lenses instead of lenses that I'm wearing right now that help me focus, what we're going to do is make ones that add blur and they blur by essentially making you focus or accommodate to the wrong distance. Right. So they they cause things to be blurry, even in your sense. Oh, that would be in all of your vision. Right. So this is blur due to your visual apparatus, what, what's going on with your focusing. The other type of main type of blur is called Gaussian blur. This is where you actually blur the image itself. Right. So you take an image, uh, whether it's a video or an image, and you add um, kind of distortion to it. You know, there's various technical details. Some, you know, we call this low pass filtering. We're filtering all the all the high spatial frequencies, all the high details. So if you start with the letters at the top, and you get at the bottom, you just get a blurry blotches. Um, and so we're distorting the image, right? So no matter who looked at it, what glasses they were wearing, what lenses they had, it, it would be blurry right? Because we, we're changing what's in the outside world to make it a lower resolution. And there's kind of some, the authors go through some nice uh, discussion of the differences between these two. Um, they're not super relevant for sports. Both have been used. Um, I think there's some, you know, uh, the first type of blur where you're blurring using lenses, there's some artifacts kind of people can still pick up some details 
whereas Gaussian blur totally removes, right? So in terms of experimental, Gaussian blur is a bit more precise and controlled. Um, an important point though is one of the advantages of the first type of blur, the optic blur, is that you can actually equate it to different levels of acuity, right? So I'll get to this in a second. You know, most people know 2020 vision. Um, blurring with lenses, you can actually simulate 2010, you know, blurring 2040, 2100, right? You can, so you can equate it to some you know, people's natural problems. Gaussian blur, you really don't have a direct equivalent to acuity, right? Because it's, it's in the image itself. Okay, so let's get into some of the research. First of all, what's the effect of blur on anticipation and decision making? So there's been a few studies that have been done using the typical temporal occlusion paradigm. So you show a person an unfolding action like a tennis serve, you occlude it at different time points, right? Early on or later, right before the ball is struck, and you ask them to make a binary two force judgment, right? Is it going down the line or cross court? And you know, this is a very standard paradigm. You know, I've I've kind of talked about some of the limitations with it, right? You're make you're you're decoupling perception and action here, obviously, because you're making a passive verbal response. But we'll we'll kind of skip that for now. So in this study in 2009, Robin Jackson and colleagues did a study where they did the basic um, anticipation task and they blurred the image, right? So they had an image that was not blurred at all, where you could see the full movement of the tennis server on a video. Then they blurred it 20% and then they blew it 40%, right? And the interesting twist they did in their study is before they tested people with blur, they under non-blur conditions, they had them do the anticipation task. And based on their performance, they did kind of a median split into good anticipators and poor anticipators under um, conditions of, of no blur, okay? So, so then they kind of tested the blur. And what they found was this interesting finding that, um, good anticipators, when you went from 0 to 20% blur, were kind of hurt in the anticipation task. Whereas poor anticipators, people that started out worse, they were kind of uh, more less accurate at judging cross-court versus down the line, they actually got slightly better, 20%, when you added blur. And then when you add more blur, both groups kind of got a little bit better again. So the, the idea here is that well, this is kind of finding that's going to come up. Blur adding blur seems to help uh, particularly lesser skilled athletes pick up information from the unfolding event. And the idea here that's been a proposal, and we'll get into this in more detail, is what, what it's doing is getting people, when you blur the image, they're picking up more of the kinematic information, maybe because you're the movement, the actual low level uh, movement cues, rather than looking at the details of you know the person's racket and their facial expressions and things like that because when you blur you're taking those things out so maybe by blurring we're actually taking away distractions and getting people to um, pick up different information and i'll talk about kind of theoretical views of this at the end okay um this would followed up you know some other types of experiments uh, Ryu, who's done a lot of call uh, experiments in this um they did um badminton players Okay, they had, again, anticipating the shot direction from a video. Um, they, um, tr they actually um, did a training intervention. So they trained people learning to do this task with blurred, okay, or uh, not blurred or under a, a normal vision conditions. So um, they either had only low spatial frequencies available, so only the coarse details, only the high details, or normal, okay? Um, and what they found was that the... Um, Low, the group that had the blurred video actually showed the greatest training benefits in terms of making the judgments, okay? And to quote them, the training intervention encouraged participants to rely more on the meaningful information, which were then able to disambiguate from deceptive information in the post-test. So what they found that in this um, test, they had actually deceptive and non-deceptive movements in terms of the serve. And they found in particular for deceptive movements, Training with the low in blur seemed to help. Okay. Um, and it also seemed to change. This was supported by they actually changed their gaze strategy when they train. They look at different parts of the server after training with low with blur. That this one shown over in B here. Right. So um they so this is again support that somehow blur seems to be helping people learn. And this is just obviously just passive anticipation of movement. So the conclusion the authors make of this review paper that summarizes the research, applying blur seems to help lesser skilled athletes because it removes distracting or irrelevant information, right? High detail information, you know, what the 
person's logo on their shirt or the, you know, is not needed to return a serve. Okay. Um, and they are, they're used more of a cognitive inf interpretation that it's this, this information may be overloading the participant by taking it away. You're guiding them to more useful information. Um, the question we'll come back to later on is whether there's any benefit for experts, right? If you're already good at uh, doing anticipation and picking up the kinematic cues, does Blur help, right? Um, there's not really a ton of evidence at all showing benefits for experts yet, but I will return to that later, okay? So these are anticipation studies. What about actually if we get to actual movement, right? So what happens when we add Blur when we're talking about skills where you're actually moving? Okay, we're actually performing skills. So perception action, perception motor control. There's been you know, quite a few studies that I've actually done on this. It started with Applegate and Applegate in 1992. They looked at the effect of uh, free throw shooting on when wearing lenses that blurred um, you know, from 2020 vision. So 2020 vision, which is 6.6 six, um, in meters, all the way up to 6.75, which is um, 22.50 vision, right? So what that means is, um, and I've shown, if you're watching the video, you can see the, the, the image on the right is what it would look like if you had 2200 vision. So 2200 vision means, 2250 vision means what a normal person, what you could normally see from 250 feet away, you need to be 20 feet away to read with, uh, with these blurring lenses on, right? So that's an enormous amount of blur, right? It's making you legally blind. Right, and the image I have here shows this is what an eye chart would um, look like if you had 2200 vision. You can barely make out the top letter and no way can you read anywhere the bottom ones, right? It's very, very poor vision. And what they found, they found a non-significant drop in performance for the first blurring, but even when they went all the way up to 2250 acuity, all the way down really, that's poor performance, there was no effect on free throw shooting performance. Right. Same Bolson and all in 2008 um, looked at um, the uh, golf putting and they found the same thing. They went up to 22,000. Right. So making you essentially blind. We could barely see the ball. Right. And you could still putt. There was no difference in golf putting. Right. This, you know, obviously you, you could make out the ball from from, uh, you know, cues, but you couldn't see all the details of it. Right. What I'm, what I'm trying to say. So. The important point about this, right, and uh, there's more and other studies uh, like this I'll show you in a second, is there are training things out there that they're training uh, tools and technologies that argue that tr improving your acuity from normal, from 2020 to something like 2015 or even 2010, so making your acuity higher is going to help you uh, as an athlete, right, help you uh, putt better, shoot better. So there's a lot of things out there training, trying to improve visual acuity through training and hoping it transfers to support. This really uh, strongly goes against that, right? If completely wrecking your acuity, making it 2200 has no effect on shooting or putting, how is making it better to 2015 gonna help, right? It doesn't seem consistent at all. One thing you could argue, you know, maybe this is the issue with this is that <clears throat> the targets you're looking at, and some people have argued, which is actually kind of not a, it's kind of a silly argument if you think about it. The problem here is that the objects, the targets you're looking at are static, right? The hoop's not moving, the golf ball's not moving. Maybe there'll be an effect of blur when you actually start like hitting, hitting a ball or catching a ball where things are moving, going on. Maybe that's when you need high acuity. Uh, as I say, that really makes no sense at all because those things rely on motion perception, which is perfectly fine in our per peripheral vision, right? Where there's low acuity. You don't need high acuity to do motion perception, but people seem to think that. Um, but in a, in a really well studied and well done study uh, uh, that I cite all the time and I've talked about on the, the podcast uh, before, <coughs> David Mann and 2000 and colleagues in 2007 really convincingly showed this, you know, this is not the case, right? They did a, a cricket batting study where they had a cricket batter um, hitting off a bowling machine where there was an image of the bowler, right? And the ball came out. So they were actually hitting. Um, they did uh, no blur all, all the way up to three diopters. There's no easy way to directly convert diopters to acuity. 
but it's very, very, if you can't see the image here, it's very, very blurred, right? You can barely make out the bowler. You certainly can't see any of the detail. And what they found was that you had to go all the way up to three diopters, the heaviest level of blur, which is legally blind before you saw any effect on hitting performance at all, right? So again, blur doesn't seem to really affect sports performance, okay? Um, and, you know, that that's kind of the, the bottom line. The last series of studies the authors review in, in, the, um, in the paper is a really interesting series done by Ryu and colleagues um, and David Mann, along with Ryu and Bruce Abernathy, looking at differences between peripheral blur versus central blur, right? So all the studies we've talked about so far have blurred everything, right? All your vision. One of the interesting things that we can do, in particular using a really clever method called gaze contingent blur, is we can selectively blur your your central vision or your um, peripheral vision. <clears throat> so what I need to what we need to do is to take an eye tracker, right? And with an eye tracker, we can know where you're looking, and we can and put something over that spot that either blurs it or completely blocks it out. So it's a it's like you're looking at the world, and there's a donut of clear and a something blocked in the middle. And I'm going to skip here to the here's an image of this. So we can uh, just make you see the middle or we could block the middle, um, or we could blur the middle or blur the surround more than it is normally, right? We, we could add extra blur to your peripheral vision. Um, so you and colleague did a bunch of studies where they tested this, this gaze. So either your central vision was blurried or blocked or your peripheral vision was more blurried or blocked. And what, what they used was a basketball decision-making task. So that you watched a video and you had to decide whether to pass, drive, shoot. And they had kind of coaches, um, uh, so it's coaches respond, uh, judge it to make the appropriate of the decision. And what they found is the basic finding, they compared experts and novices. Experts could handle all the conditions better than novices. Okay. Um, the novices were more, um, they had trouble when central vision was blurred. Okay. Um, they, when you had to use just a peripheral vision, experts could do this fine when they had that, when the central vision was blocked, whereas novices really struggled. So what they did was they followed this up with a training study where they actually had um, novices. They had 40, 50 novices train, and they trained under different conditions. Full vision, um, the peripheral was more blurred than normal, which is what I have shown in the, the picture here. You're clear in the center, more blurred than normal in the surround. Um, the center blur blurred and the uh, surround normal, and just a control group that just did uh, no training. And what they found, again, consistent with those earlier findings, is that adding blur to your peripheral vision and make having your central vision clear helped train helped these uh, uh, novice athletes be better at decision making this basketball task. Okay, um, and as it says here, to quote them, the authors suggest that the enhanced learning following training in the peripheral peripheral blur condition was in part result of the peripheral blur enhancing participants' use of information available in central vision. Okay, again, blurring, this case, blurring the peripheral vision seems to help by taking away some information and pushing you to the other, right? Whether you think about that as a cognitive effect where the, the other information is distracting, right, is, is the main way kind of to interpret it. Now, I'll, I'll think of, uh, present my view in a second, right? So overall, the authors sum up in the paper, you know, training with blur seems to have clear benefits for lesser skilled performers. Whether you just do it with lenses, glasses with lenses that blur out, um, you know, training them to pick up the, the movements of an opponent or hitting up a pitch, you know, viewing a pitcher. Um, these seem to have clear benefits. The gaze contingent ones where you selectively block out the periphery and, and, and central vision seem to be even more so, have a lot of really strong benefits. And the authors proposed, and they're, they're actually developing this themselves, they describe a bit of their system, that this could easily be implemented in VR, right? In VR, we don't need to, you know, we could easily block out a, your central vision or your peripheral vision or whatever area we want. Whether this is beneficial to experts too still needs more research, right? There's some suggestions it is, but, but I think it, it still definitely needs more research. So... To final point I'll make, you know, the way that I would interpret all these results, right, is in the constraints, right, in the constraints, ecological approach, right? Blur is a constraint, right? It's a constraint. It's taking away some information, right? It's taking away the high de detail information 
and encouraging you to explore, right? It's encouraging you to educate your attention, you know, in direct learning to other information sources, right? So whether it's the kinematics of the movement, whether it's looking at more details and central vision of the players moving around, right? So I don't think we need the cognitive overload explanation, right? It's a constraint that's encouraging exploration. And one of the phrases I like to use sometimes is it's destabilizing the information attractors, right? So attractors, we tend to think about in terms of movement, right? You have a tractor for a particular movement pattern. There's also, I think, very clear attractors for information sources, right? We get stuck using certain information sources because it worked. They pretty much work. If we destabilize that by adding a constraint, we can get people to explore different information sources in the same way we can get them to explore different movements, right? So I think all of this is very fascinating. Research can easily be interpreted under an ecological constraints approach. Okay, that's it for this review of this, uh, you know, really interesting article. Um, thanks for listening and cheers for now and keep them coupled.